Good evening and welcome to our first midweek Advent. In, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Let my prayer rise before you as incense. The lifting, the lifting up, up of my hands, hands as the evening, evening sacrifice. The Lord Almighty grant us a quiet night and peace at the last. Amen. Amen. It is good to give thanks to the Lord. To sing it's praise to your name, O Most High, God. to herald your love in the morning, your in truth, truth at the close of the day. day. From the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the wicked. Make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Sanctify us in your truth. Your word is true. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Our first reading this evening is from the book of Genesis, chapter 3. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked, and I hid myself. He said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me the fruit of the tree, and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock, and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. To the woman he said, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. And to Adam he said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread, till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. The man called his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all living. And the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skins and clothed them. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us in knowing good and evil. Now, lest he reach out his hand, and take also the tree of life and eat, and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him out from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man, and at the east of the Garden of Eden he placed the cherubim and the flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. A reading from Romans chapter 3. But if our unrighteousness serves to show the righteousness of God, what shall we say? That God is unrighteous to inflict wrath on us? I speak in a human way, by no means. For then how could God judge the world? 
But if through my lie God's truth abounds to his glory, why am I still being condemned as a sinner? And why not do evil that good may come? As some people slanderously charge us with saying, their condemnation is just. What then? Are we Jews better off? No, not at all. For we have already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, are under sin, as it is written. None is righteous, no, not one, no one understands, no one seeks for God. All have turned aside, together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Their throat is an open grave, they use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asps is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood, and their paths are ruin and misery. And the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be stopped, and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the third chapter. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world. And people loved the darkness rather than the light, because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light, and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. This is the Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch. This is the name by which he will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. He shall reign as king and deal wisely and shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. This is the name by which he will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. This is the name by which he will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. What are God's holy commandments? You shall have no other gods. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Honor your father and your mother. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or his manservant, or maidservant, his ox or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. What is the creed of our faith? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born in the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We all know the story of Adam and Eve and the fall into sin. It's one of the first, if not the first, Bible story that we are taught. It's so familiar, in fact, that we maybe don't think too closely about a lot of things that happened on that day. 
And perhaps we don't dwell on them because it's just too depressing, too tragic to keep lingering in our thoughts. It's hard for us to comprehend that Adam lived until nearly the time Enoch was taken up by God, which was not long before the flood, for hundreds of years. Adam would give a first-person eyewitness account of the day it happened, the day that Adam and Eve broke the world and allowed sin and death to poison paradise. What were those conversations like? It's not hard for us to imagine that they never, ever got any easier. How do you look in the eye of another person and say, all of this is my fault? The reason we all die is me. Words can't express the emotions that Adam and Eve must have felt when they were cast out of paradise the garden temple of the Lord, where he came to dwell with his creations, was forever cut off from them. They could no longer commune with him in the intimate way that he had ordained for all men to dwell together with him. Imagine the emptiness that they felt. Life is no longer comfortable, and now it is filled with pain, something they've never experienced before, pain in childbirth, Pain from the laborer now required to grow food. When you struggle to put food on your table, or pay the mortgage, or get out from under medical bills, do you not feel that same hollowness inside? Don't we sinfully sometimes feel as though God has cut himself off from us? Or isn't it really we who cut ourselves off from God? This is the penalty of seeking after forbidden knowledge. To know good and evil is to experience corruption, pain, suffering, want and lack, and terror, loneliness, and ultimately death. Knowledge of evil means the shedding of blood that has entered the world. Embarrassed by their nakedness, Adam and Eve fashioned coverings for themselves, but they were only made of leaves. They wouldn't last. God made them clothes out of animal skins. They don't last forever, either. God must have shown them how to do it for themselves. Did God make them watch as those animals died for them? As he cut the skin from their bodies to provide a covering for their shame? Sometimes we think the fall into sin as some kind of abstract idea. Or sinfully, we believe that the problem of evil in the world was all Adam and Eve's fault, now we have to live with the repercussions. But we're no different or any better than they. As Paul wrote to the Romans, none is righteous, no, not one. No one understands, no one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asps is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood, and their paths are ruin and misery, and the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Paradise is now lost to men, not only because of Adam and Eve and their sin, but also because of your and my sin. No more garden walks in the cool of the day, having conversations with God. But God did not abandon our first parents, not at all. God promised a new Adam to come to set them free from their bondage to sin, their imminent date with death, and the schemes of the serpent, Satan. God promised to send them a redeemer, a savior who would remake the world, and he would remake them in his image once more. God would one day dwell with man in his temple again. Paradise would be restored. Our modern age seems like a miracle of connectedness. We carry around devices which allow us to talk with just about any other person on the planet with a similar device and do it instantly. Even here tonight, we're worshiping together over the internet because we have no power in the other church building. And we're thankful for this technology. It's seen us through some of the hardships of the measures we've had to take to stay safe during the pandemic. Yet studies have shown 
can our hearts and minds confirm this? That being more connected to one another than at any other time in history, we actually feel more detached than ever before. We feel isolated or even forgotten. Just about anybody has felt lonely at one time or another this year. God designed us for actual face-to-face -face interaction with one another. We're social creatures, not hermits. After thousands of years, the ultimate in human interaction is still to sit down together at a table and share a meal together. Yet even that has been soured by social distancing or using it as an excuse to not be social. How much more socially distant can we get than to be cut off from communion with our Lord? What was broken and lost in paradise will be restored on the last day. But even now, the Lord has not abandoned us completely. When his children cried out for deliverance from their Egyptian masters, God heard their prayers. He led them out and led them toward a new land that he would give them. Canaan would be a foretaste of the paradise to come. And he was with them every step of the way of their 40-year journey. The people craved the presence of God, but they could only worship through an intermediary, a kind of social media, if you will, where the priest offered sacrifices and prayers to the Lord as the people's go-between. And God taught Moses how to build the tabernacle, a tent of meeting where God could dwell with his people, but again, not in the same intimate way that he did in paradise. We talk of our technology connecting us to the cloud. God literally came to the tabernacle with us in the glory cloud, which would rest above the most holy place in the tent of meeting. When it was time to move on, the pillar of cloud would raise up and it would go before them by day and appear as a pillar of fire by night to lead their way until they arrived at the next camping spot. God's presence was with his people once again, but it was not the same, much more so than worshiping online is not the same. Priests and prophets continued to be the mediators between God and man, seemingly forever separated. But the prophets told of the coming Messiah, the Savior, promised to Adam and Eve the day paradise was broken by their sin. Jesus Christ would tabernacle in the womb of a virgin, be born a human child, and transcend all of the prayers and sacrifices of priests. For us, a child was born to dwarf the sacrifices offered by men, and he became the ultimate sacrifice to heal the gulf between God and men. His life would be given for the sins of the world as a lamb led to slaughter. This is what it takes to restore paradise. The infinite word, the creator of all things, clothes himself, not the skin of animals, but human flesh. He injects himself into our broken world, not as a mighty king come to conquer, not as we think of it anyway, but as a single microscopic cell in the womb of Mary. This is the miracle promised to us by God in Eden, the one who would put enmity between the devil and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He will bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel, as God told the serpent. And just as the child Christ was wrapped in swaddling clothes, our salvation is wrapped up in his holy incarnation, the ultimate expression of God's desire to be connected to us in a personal, direct manner. Is God in the form of Jesus living in our own skin with all the trials and all the temptations that go with it? Through God's great mercy that not one of his sheep be lost, he sent his only son to die our death and then to rise from the grave to put an end to death forever. One day, paradise will be permanently restored. And more importantly, the relationship between God and each of his own, all of whom he calls by name, will be rebuilt and become unbreakable. Ultimately, 
We are to be clothed not in leaves, not in animal skins, but clothed with the righteousness of Christ, washed free from sin by the waters of holy baptism. But not yet. We may not have a tabernacle or a temple. We may not have offer sacrifices upon our altar, but the restoration of Eden has begun in each of us. One day we will sit at the table with our Lord, but until then, because Jesus has appeared once for all at the end of the ages, to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself, we can sit together at another table, where we partake of his sacrifice under bread and wine for the forgiveness of our sins and the strengthening of our faith. And despite our need for keeping our distance right now, despite power outages, despite icy streets, the saints can gather together to receive the fruit of his sacrifice and look to the resurrection of the dead and the advent of the new Eden, where Christ will be the only source of light we will ever need. In the name of Jesus, amen. May the peace which passes all understanding guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Trusting in our Lord's promises, we are bold to pray. Our Father, Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us for evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the gift of divine peace in our heart, with all our heart and with all our mind, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the Holy Christian Church, here and scattered throughout the world, and for the proclamation of the gospel, and the calling of all to faith, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this nation, for our cities and communities, and for the common welfare of us all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For seasonable weather and for the fruitfulness of the earth, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those who labor, for those whose work is difficult or dangerous, and for all who travel, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all those in need, for the hungry and homeless, for the widowed and orphaned, and for all those in prison, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the sick and the dying, and for all those who care for them, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Finally, for these and for all our needs of body and soul, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Amen. Merciful and gracious Lord, you cause your word to be proclaimed in every generation. Stir up our hearts and minds by your Holy Spirit, that we may receive this proclamation with humility, and finally be exalted at the coming of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Blessed Lord, you have caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning. Grant that we may so hear them, read, mark, learn, and take them to heart, that by patience and comfort of your holy word, we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus, Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have graciously kept me this day. And I pray that you would forgive me all my sins, for I have done wrong, and graciously keep me this night. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul in all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. 
The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Have a blessed evening.